to Kirkstone Botanica. Today we'll be starting the first of our potting up series. We're going to be looking at putting up a small Eucomus camosa which has just arrived. And as you can see it's a plug-in plant which means it's been grown in a restricted environment which means that the roots are all together so that you can literally make a hole in the ground, put it in or put it in a pot with the minimum of fuss. So the preparation consists of taking a half pot, I, pre I prefer to use half pots for most bulbs, although later on we'll be talking why some bulbs with longer root systems need tall pots, but I prefer bulb pots. In fact these half pots in the UK are often called bulb pots. So there's the preparation. I put uh, about half an inch, three quarters of an inch of raw compost uninterfered with straight out of the bag into the pot and I've also put a small amount of grow more fertilizer which I've mixed in. Now the next thing is to take another prepared mixture and I've got in this bucket which I'm stirring away quite happily as if I was making a cake I've got exactly one third of coarse horticultural special horticultural sand and I'll be talking about sand mixes a little bit later. I've also got a third of the compost which is at the bottom of the pot and a third of coarse grit. And again this is special horticultural grit. And I've mixed that up well and I'm going to work out roughly the depth that the plant is going to sit at which seems rather an obvious thing which has already been established by the growth pattern. So the mix we've made is going to take us to round about there, maybe slightly more. And that's roughly the position we're going to be in. Now I'm always very careful because I have a bit of an obsession about this of trying to get the plant right in the middle. Quality counts. So to keep the plant in position I will now put some more of the remaining mix around the compost and I'll use all of that so we know that the plant is going to stay exactly where it should be. Now holding the plant firmly, I'll tap around. Now personally, I never like to push soil down. I never like to compress soil. And the reason for that is because I believe it interferes with drainage. And also because it makes it difficult for a new plant that's trying to get established to actually force those fine roots through the soil particles. So there's the plant set. I'll then take some much coarser grit, so this is basically small pebbles, about 15 to 20 millimeter size, and then I will top the soil and there's a couple of reasons for this. First of all it's purely aesthetic, it means that we can actually look at something which is a bit more attractive to the eye than brown soil or compost. And the other one of course is very practical that if you put a covering, especially a heavy covering, on top of the soil then that stops the soil washing away, especially when it's new. And there we are, just potted up new young Eucomus van der Merwijn.
Okay, good morning, good afternoon, assalamu alaikum, mabariyako, como steas, how are you, how is your day going? Well, here we are back at uh, Kirkstone Botanica, having a very, very quick look at one side of the greenhouse, which has got a lot of the cacti, bulbs, both active and dormant, and um, some amaryllids, some cordiciform succulents, but... Mostly the smaller cacti are all together in, in one place. So essentially we're going to have a, a quick look through and then in later videos and later discussions we're going to come back to some more of the individual species and genera which the development of which you can follow on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram where we'll be looking at the growth of plants and development over days and weeks and Basically taking a long-term view, which is the way I look at the whole horticultural hobby. So we have um, some Clivias, some Nerines, some Buofinae and Brunswickia just starting into growth with their winter growing system. And some Crenums, Crenum bulbispermum is just starting off, a new leaf's just appeared. A very um, vigorous Amarine Belladilla, which is a hybrid between Amaryllis belladonna and Nerine baudenii, um, Tulbagia, some more Hymenocallis, another Boophene, which is just starting into growth for the years, throwing up some new leaves, some Brunswickia and Brunsdonna hybrids, and the type species Amaryllis belladonna is just sitting deciding whether or not it's going to grow or not. So then we have other plants, we have Areocyce, uh, Neoporteria, Hawaltheas, Astrophytum, Scopiopoa, Aroya, some more succulents mixed in, there's a Euphorbia, a small collection of Anacampsaros, which of course we should be calling Avonia now, as the more interesting dwarf species of the Anacampsaros group have been separated off into their own genus Avonia. So there's Albicima. Alstonii and Papyracia, and then some Hawarthias, Hawarthia pumula, beautiful polka dot Hawarthia, a hybrid, Hawarthia truncata crystal tips, um, some more Euphorbias, Copiapoe lauii, Astrophytum capricornae, there's some lovely pictures of this plant, Astrophytum, on the Facebook page for Kirkstone Botanica, and also on Instagram now, and then the, the cacti that you would regard as perhaps more choice, the smaller growing ones, Astrophytum asturias, we have two um, copies of them, Gymnocalicium uh, stenoclada we would call it now, but I've always known it as Friedrichii or Mihanovicii, some more smaller Ureocytes, this is Nepina, Copiapoa griseoviolacea and Copiapoa mollicula. Then we have a more general section which includes a lot of the amaryllids and also some of the other plants which are green just to mix in because when the amaryllids are in their bulbous form there's not a great deal to see I mean a lot of people just actually take them away and put them in bags or bags of peat or whatever but I like to keep them out in the pots ready to go as soon as they're ready so we have a row of Dorbenia here none of which are very exciting because they're all under the ground but as you come along through the Dorbenia section and then towards Masonia, we can see that we do have a little bit of growth on this Masonia postulata, just starting to stick its leaves up between the grit. And as we move along a bit more, we can see going through Masonia depressa, Masonia hirsuta, and Masonia citrina, we have another new arrival for the day. Just appearing for the first time, I don't know if you can see that, Masonia longipace is just starting to pop up. Can you see her yet? There she is, just coming out there. Then we have a big collection of amaryllids. We have Hippiastrelia, the hybrid between Hippiastrum and Sprachelia formosissima. Then we have some Hippiastrum species, Equestri, Stylosum and all the rest. And we have some more plants just starting into growth for the year. We have a Hemanthus section here. This is Hemanthus multiflorus or Scadoxus 
multiflorous has just burst the top of its bulb ready to come out and I have a smaller one of the same species here and we have a nice interesting little plant here which is albuca now this is a plant which is quite common this albuca this is from Algrabis Hills now it's been in cultivation and in circulation for quite a long time but nobody really seems to know what species it is and nobody's bothered to try and classify it so for nearly 25-30 years it's just remained as Algrebes Hills. Now it's a long-leaved albuca form, very xerophytic, um, doesn't look anything at all like Lithopsoides which we'll see a little bit later. Um, towards the back we have some Strumerias that have been growing for a while, this is Strumeria caruica and then we have another Boophanae, Boophanae hemanthoides is again just starting to grow. You can just see those green leaves popping up there. So some more strongly growing amaryllids and then a very nice multi-headed clump of Hemanthus albifloss. This really is one of my favourite plants. It's so reliable and it's an evergreen bulb of course. So once it stops growing it, the leaves stay there and the leaves only start to wither as the new leaves come along. So you've always got a green display. And then another one of my absolute favourites, Hemanthus coccineus. Now, I've put lots of stuff about Hemanthus coccineus on the YouTube videos and on Facebook and on Instagram. It's just finished flowering. I'm sure you can see that. And two strong leaves are coming up between the remains of last year's leaves. Now I know a lot of people would remove last year's leaves but we have a very dry greenhouse and there's not normally a problem with rot or mildew or any fungal infection. So I thought I'd leave the leaves on to see whether this year's leaves are bigger. I suspect they might be. So we move into a section which is more or less devoted to Liliales, the Liliaceae group. So we've got aloes and we've also got some bulbous plants here. We've got some small collection of Lediburia. So we've got Lediburia socialis, the plant that used to be known as Scylla violacea. And we've got a plant which just arrived yesterday and is brand new to me, Manfreda, Manfreda guttata. So a very close relative of the agaves. In fact, it can interbreed with agaves to form the mangrave um, hybrid genus. An interesting group, these uh, aloes. So we've got some more bulbous xerophytes here. We've got another albuca just starting to grow. Albuca and polyphylla. And we've also got another ornithogalum, which probably is reclassified as albuca now because they're always moving them around. This is ornithogalum lithopsoides. So lithopsoides means looking like a stone or looking like a rock. So we move across from these dormant Masonias and Dorbenias and another dormant Ornithogalum. This is Dor Ornithogalum apertum. Now this has got a, an interesting label. It says on the label Ornithogalum apertum Lavronos 29904. This means that the genetic material that this plant is grown from was actually connected, collected by uh, John Lavronos in South Africa. So we have a very important botanical record of exactly what that uh, plant represents in terms of gene type. So I hope that answers your question, Andrea, about why there's sometimes numbers on labels. Uh, then we have another growing collection, very quick, because it's a genius I've become very interested in. And we've got a little section of dwarf aloes. So we have a one of the smallest aloes, Aloe de Coingsy, at the front here. And then we've got uh, one of my favorites, a new hybrid, Aloe hybrid Cleopatra. You can see it's a remarkably colourful plant which has not only dark green and white stripes made from rows of transverse tubercles, but it also has this delicious reddy pink spination on the edges and points of the leaves. It really is as beautiful as its namesake. And similar plant here, Aloe hybrid Franco, again just arrived, so not in its best condition but it will it'll soon recover and then some species we've got aloe brumii and we've got aloe juvena and another new hybrid this is called snowflake which is a slightly less aggressively striped form than a similar new aloe hybrid which is called aloe snowstorm 
Uh, I've actually got an aloe snowstorm on the way, so we'll be able to compare snowstorm and snowflake very soon. So some more aloe hybrids, a very common plant which most people have seen and possibly possess in the gardens, the partridge breasted aloe, aloe variegata, easy to grow and utterly beautiful. I, I never get bored with this plant even though it's so common. Then another unusual aloe hybrid, this is aloe cosmo, large plant as you can see, beautifully coloured, almost like a, a giant hawthia. And then finally at the back we have aloe erinacea, which is now being uh, demoted to synonymy or subspecies status with aloe melanocantha. So it now should be known as aloe erinacea subspecies melanocantha. But to me it's, it's a very different plant. It has a different formation, a different morphology, it's smaller growing. And I, I think personally I would keep it in a, in a separate grouping. And we have a few more dwarf aloes moving towards the back and a quick overview of the most of the cacti, some of the bulbs and some of the bulbous plants collection here at Kirkstone. Now we'll be updating this greenhouse walkthrough very very regularly. I do hope you keep tuned for more videos. I'd like you to become involved to add comments, criticisms, observations and if you go to the Facebook and Instagram pages I'd really like you to start posting pictures of your own specimen plants and even if you like raise concerns or ask questions about health, propagation or cultivation. So there's the Kirkstone Botanica YouTube channel which is where you are right now and there's also the Facebook page Kirkstone Botanica there's the Instagram site, Kirkstone Botanica 2007, and there's also other media outlets coming on stream. We are, we are playing with Twitter right now, but I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of Twitter. But there is a Kirkstone Botanica 2007 Twitter account too. So YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please like, comment, and subscribe. page and the Instagram account of Kirkstone Botanica we've been following the progress into flowering of this small strumeria, strumeria caruica. And uh, What's interesting now is this plant has been really really heavily frequented by small flying insects and hoverflies in particular and what we're seeing now as the flowers are actually dying away is we can see that the flower spikes which looks like a a miniature Brunswickia or a Crocyne is the flower spikes are actually all developing 
into the typical amaryllid seed bearing structure. So you can see these small globular uh, seed um, bearing pods as the flowers wither. So it looks like we're going to have a rather a good crop of uh, Strumeria seed which will be available on the Kirkstone um, Botanica sales page. Thank <laughs> you.